Hello everyone, welcome to Cashcroft TV. My name is Kalen Ashcroft. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ages of Empires, where we will be going through all the major world empires throughout history. And as well, we will highlight a leader from each empire as well to learn a little bit more about the empire and about leadership as well. In this episode, we will be covering the Tibetan Empire and Song Tsen Gampo. And as well, so this is a little bit of a uh, nuance here in that some consider the second Turkic Kagnot not even Kaganate to not even ne technically be an empire. So I've kind of merged that in with the Uyghur Kaganate. Um, pardon me for my pronunciation, but that's the best I can do. Uyghur will be how I will pronounce it for the course of the episode. My apologies if that's not perfect. But nonetheless, sort of the second Tur Turkic Kaganate will build into the Uyghur Kaganate and we'll sort of cover them together. And the Uyghur Kaganate was larger as well. And as well, from that, this empire, we will cover Kutleg, the first Bilge Kagan. Kagans are like Khans, as you might know. Genghis Khan, who came quite a while later, but that's probably the most famous Khan we know of today. So a Kaganate is one ruled by a Khan. So those are the two empires and two leaders we were covering. And at the very end, in the style of Plutarch's Parallel Lives, probably maybe the most influential book in my life, we will compare both of the leaders to sort of see how they're unique in their differences and also retroactively learn a little bit more about both of their empires and sort of just close off the episode. And so, so that is what we will do. So without further ado, we'll begin with the first empire. So the Tibetan Empire. So the Tibetan Empire, also known as the Yarlang Yarlung Dynasty, pardon me, was a powerful political and military entity that emerged in Central Asia during the seventh century CE Common Era. Its rise and fall are marked by a complex interplay of political, cultural, and military factors, which we will outline. So for some brief overview first, so the Tibetan Empire was an empire centered on the Tibetan Plateau, formed as a result of imperial expansion under the Yarlung dynasty, heralded by its 33rd king, Songtsen Gampo. So Songtsen Gampo founded this the Tibetan Empire, and he was the 33rd king. I think 33 is a beautiful number. I, I like the number three. I was born on August 3rd for no other reason. In the 7th century, the empire further expanded under the 38th king, particularly such a named Tri Song Detsen, and expanded to its greatest extent under its 41st king, Rapal Chen, whose 821 to 823 treaty was concluded between the Tibetan Empire and the Tang Dynasty, which we have previously covered, so interacted heavily with the Tang Dynasty. This treaty carved the Jokhang Pillar, delineated Tibet as being in possession of an area larger than the Tibetan Plateau, so expanding it so beyond the Tibetan Plateau, stretching east to Shang'an and west beyond modern Afghanistan and south to modern day India and the Bay of Bengal, so quite a lot larger than and not only restricted to the Tibetan Plateau, the Tibetan Empire was. So as to by, uh, go through history of its rise and fall, so starting with the rise, the 7th century formation. So the Tibetan Empire originated in the Yarlung Valley, hence the name the Yarlung Dynasty, in the 7th century, the Yarlung Valley. The legendary figure Nyati Tsenpo is often credited as the first Tibetan king established, establishing the Yarlung Dynasty. As for Songsten Gampo, whom we will highlight specifically in a biography, in this, uh, the range from seven, 617 to 650 CE, one of the key figures in the early Tibetan Empire was King Songsten Gampo. He expanded Tibetan territory through military conquests, incorporating various regions of Central Asia. Songsten Gampo is also known for his role in introducing Buddhism to Tibet. So also, many leaders we've highlighted so far have been instrumental in growing Buddhism, and I've always posed the question, to what extent was Songtsen Gampo influential in the rise of Buddhism? So there are a lot of important Buddhist monks in Tibet even today, so maybe if it weren't for Songtsen Gampo, maybe it would not be as significant. But maybe it would have happened without him. It's sort of the Tolstoyan argument, to what extent was Napoleon the cause or sort of the product of the French Revolution or, the, or his own empire? 
As for further on Buddhism in Tibet, the Tibetan Empire's adoption of Buddhism under the influence of Song Tsen Gampo and his queens helped to shape the cultural and religious identity of the region. This period saw the construction of significant Buddhist monuments, including the Jokhang Temple in Lhasa. Famous. As for military expansion, the Tibetan Empire expanded its influence into neighboring regions, including parts of China, Nepal, and the Himalayan regions. Military campaigns were carried out to consolidate power and control key trade routes. So not just the peaceful Buddhists, as Mong Lee thought, this empire had military capacities as well. As for the zenith, under Tri Song Detsen, who reigned from 755 to 797 CE, the zenith of the Tibetan Empire is often associated with the reign of King Tri Song Detsen. Detsen. During his rule, Buddhism was further promoted, and Tibet witnessed a flourishing of cultural and intellectual activities. Tri Song Detsen invited eminent Buddhist scholars, including Guru Padmasam Baba and Santara Kish. Shita to Tibet, so brought some very prominent Buddhist um, leaders to Tibet to strengthen the religion. But sort of it was Songsen Gampo, Gampo who brought Buddhism or made Buddhism the state religion to begin with. As for the confrontation with the Chang or the Tang dynasty, pardon me, or Tong dynasty, actually it's pronounced, pardon me. Um, that, but once again, I'm trying to do phonetical, so people who might be looking at the captions or trying to write this down, it's T-A-N-G, but it's Tong, I believe, is the proper pronunciation, dynasty. And these are the interactions between the Tibetan Empire and the Tong dynasty. So the Tibetan Empire clashed with the Chinese Tong dynasty in the mid-8th century over the Silk Road trade routes. So they argued over trade and economic dispute, the source. The, pet, the Tibetans briefly captured the Chinese capital, Shang'an, in 763. So the Tibetan Empire conquered or the capital of China at one point, of the Tang Dynasty. However, due to internal strife and external pressure, the Tibetan control over the Chinese territories was short-lived. So, But nonetheless, they achieved it. As for decline, fragmentation and civil wars. So after the death of Trisong Detson, the M Tibetan Empire faced internal conflicts and power struggles. The empire fragmented into smaller regional entities and civil wars ensued among the noble families. So fragmentation, lack of centralization, common theme amongst the empires we've covered so far in their declines. And further for the specific uprising in 842, in 842 CE, a major uprising known as the Lugu Revolt erupted in central Tibet, leading to the decline of the Yarlung dynasty. This event further weakened the centralized authority of the Tibetan Empire. So ended with sort of a boom at the end of sort of a big uprising to conclude it. Further to the invasions by the Mongols, which followed in the 9th century, CE, the Tibetan Empire faced invasions by the forces of Tanguts and the Mongols. The Mongol invasions led by Tangut, the ruler Tangut ruler Mu Rong Shun, significantly contributed to the collapse of the Tibetan political structure. So once again, these internal factors sort of maybe came first in this case, and the external factors came after, but they sort of the external factors, my presumption would be were more impactful because of the internal factors. As for fragmentation and regional rule, by the 10th century, the Tibetan Empire was disintegrated into smaller regional kingdoms and principalities. The political landscape of Tibet underwent significant changes and with no central authority existing, exerting control over the entire region. So fragmentation is a very common theme across, if not outright getting conquered, probably the other most likely outcome would be fragmentation. As while the Tibetan Empire is thus while the Tibetan Empire as a centralized authority entity declined, its cultural and religious legacy persisted. For example, Buddhism remained, shaping the subsequent his history of Tibet. The region continued to be influenced by Buddhism and later historical developments, such as the emergence of the Dalai Lama institution, played crucial roles in the Tibetan history. So this em this empire is very important to study because those later things, such as the Dalai Lama, follow this important empire. And how much they expanded beyond the Tibetan plateau is very quite yeah, magnificent. Even they even conquered the Tang Dynasty um, capital at one point. Magnificent from a military standpoint, not necessarily saying it was ethical or anything. I'll stay neutral on that one. So as for the life of Song Sen's Gampo, 
So the most important ruler of the Tibetan Empire is often considered Song Tsen Gampo, whose reign from 617 to 650 CE played a pivotal role in shaping the empire's destiny. Therefore, we seek to find a biography of his life. First, so for some background information, so Song Tsen Gampo, was um, also known as Song Zan Gambu, was the 33rd Tibetan king, I like the number personally, and founder of the Tibetan Empire, and is traditionally credited with the introduction of Buddhism to the Tibet. Huge influence, because Buddhism is still prominent in Tibet today. Influenced by his Nepali consort, Bhubirikuti of Nepal's Lichavi dynasty, as well as with the unification of what had previously been several Tibetan kingdoms, so interactions with ancient India, or maybe not ancient at this point, but historical India. Well, I think we can still call it ancient nonetheless. But nonetheless, there was interactions with India to bring in Buddhism, but also through conquering other parts of the Tibetan kingdom, several other Tibetan kingdoms, as we shall see. He is also regarded as responsible for the creation of the Tibetan script and therefore the establishment of classical Tibetan, so the establishment of the language too, so the religion and the language, his influence is, is almost impossible to overstate. The language spoken in his region at the time and the literary language of Tibet, so a huge influence too, both on language and religion, and no doubt also probably in effect culture generally. So, as for his early life, who was this individual? So, his birth. So, Song Ten Gampo was born in 617 CE. So, there's debate some. I saw some sources noted his reign began in 617, and or his birth was in 617. I think it's more likely his birth, but nonetheless. He was the son of King Namri Song Ten and Queen Drizza Tokarma. So, he was the son of the king and the queen. So, not a, not a bastard, not some from the non-royal lineage, sort of as we talk about sort of who comes from success and rises to success, comparing our leaders, as we shall see, he definitely sort of started with a, one of the best outcomes he could have. But nonetheless, he, his empire wasn't. The Tibetan Empire didn't exist until him, so he still created the empire. But he did come from royal lineage, it must be noted. His birth was accompanied by various auspicious signs, which were seen as indicators of his future greatness. Perhaps they were retroactively um, applied, or maybe they were true as well. So as for his consolidation of power, so his ascension to the throne, so Song Sen Gampo ascended to the throne at a young age after the death of his father. His early years were marked by challenges from rival factions and neighboring states, so it wasn't that easy, although he naturally assumed the throne, but he sort of subdued those threats somewhat early on and began his military campaign. So Song Ten Gampo initiated military campaigns to consolidate and expand the territorial boundaries of the Tibetan Empire. He successfully conquered various regions in Central Asia, including parts of China and Nepal. So, those not easy areas to conquer, particularly China, the Tang Dynasty. As for Buddhism and cultural contributions, as noted, introduction of Buddhism, so one of Song Ten Gampo's significant contributions was the introduction of Buddhism to Tibet, which we've already alluded to. He's credited with marrying two foreign princesses as well. Wen, Wen Cheng from Chinese Tong Dynasty and Biri Kuti from Nepal, so marrying two foreign brides. So, but, so maybe diplomatic, thing, but maybe it was love, perhaps. Both of whom brought Buddhist influences to their regions as well, so further strengthening Buddhism. As for construction projects, Song Tsen Gampo was instrumental in the construction of important Buddhist monuments. Notably, he ordered the building of Zhou Kang Temple in Lhasa, which became a central pilgrimage site and is considered one of the holiest temples in Tibetan Buddhism. Absolutely beautiful site. I should have put it on the slide, my apologies, but we've got some other nice images we will cover soon. As for his political achievements, the establishment of the centralized administration, Song Tsen Gampo worked to establish a centralized administrative system to govern the diverse regions of the Tibetan Empire. This laid the foundation for a more organized and efficient government structure. As for diplomatic relations, through strategic marriages and alliances, Song Tsen Gampo strengthened diplomatic ties with neighboring states, including the Chinese Tong Dynasty in Nepal. These alliances played a crucial role in the geopolitical stability of the Tibetan Empire during his reign. As for later years and legacy, as for cultural patronage, Song Tsen Gampo continued to support and patronize the arts, literature, and sciences, as we noted, bringing the language or 
creating a script, formally adopting it. Maybe it had already existed before, but he was just the first to codify it. His reign is often associated with the flourishing of cultural and intellectual activities as well. But as for succession and descendants, Song Sen Gampo had several sons, among them Tri Sen Detsen, who was one of the greatest following leaders, who would later become another significant ruler of Tibet. His royal lineage continued with the establishment of the Yarlung dynasty. So some of the other leaders we've covered have been the, the zenith, so they got the pinnacle of the Tibetan Empire. He was not at the zenith, but he found it. Also a gift and a curse of being at the zenith. If you are at the zenith, your descendant necessarily doesn't do as well as you. So Song San Gampo may be better that his descendants did better than him, and he founded the empire. So maybe it's better to be first than to be best. That's speculation. could be the other way around. I'm just throwing around arguments here. As for his death, Song Tse, oh, and pardon me, the royal lineage continued with the establishment of the Yar Lung dynasty, so he formed the dynasty as well. But maybe he would have been poor if he was an intermediary, or maybe everything was already set up for him and maybe it was easy going, so not necessarily being the first is the best either. As for his death, Song Tse Gampo passed away in 650 CE, leaving behind a legacy that profoundly influenced Tibetan history, as we mentioned in so many ways. His death marked the end of an era characterized by military expansion, cultural development, and the establishment of Buddhism in Tibet. Thus, Song Sen's Gampo's contributions to Tibetan history, particularly through the realms of politics, religion, culture, language, and language laid the groundwork for the subsequent development and architecture of the Tibetan Empire and its enduring impact on the P Tibetan people. So very important leader. So, as for the content of the slide, moving forward, so the title, we have Song Sen Gampo and the Tibetan Empire, also known as Bo Chen Po, or Great Tibet. It was centered on the Tibetan Plateau, as one might guess. The significant leader is Song Sen Gampo, with one G, my apologies for the second first G. Um, as for empire, it was Tibetan Empire. The period was 618 to 842, or 848 CE, and it's considered in the late antiquity period. The modern locations include Tibet, Bhutan, Nepal, India, and China. Million square kilometers is 4.6 million square kilometers. That is quite massive. That is as large as some as like our Babylonian Empire, for example, but smaller than some of the others. Some of the, for example, the most recent ones we call like the Abbasid Empire was about twice the size, but nonetheless, it was difficult areas to conquer, and it's still far more significant and some of the others, many are in the 1 million square kilometer range. Athens and Greece, very famously written about, are not even in the point one, so very, very significant. Million square kilometers equivalent is 1.78 million square kilometers. Percent of the world says 3.41%, excluding Antarctica, but once again, highly contested areas. They're competing with the Tang Dynasty, which is the, the most powerful dynasty in, the di in China at the time, and as well, many powerful individuals and states in India at the time. The capital was Lhasa. Government was a monarchy. Common languages include Tibetic languages. Religion was Tibetan Buddhism and Bon. And population was 10 million. In the top left, we have an image of Song Tseng Gampo on a horse. Not an image, pardon An image of a statue of him on a horse, horseback in front of the Song Tsen Library in Dehradun, India. To the right, we have the standard of the Tibetan king, Song Tseng Gampo. In, we found if I'm, reigned in the 7th century. Below that, on the cross-looking uh, uh, plaque, we have a bilingual text of a peace treaty inscribed on the Tong Tibetan Alliance in front of Zhou Tang Temple. So very important, showing the negotiations between the Tibetan Empire and the Tong Dynasty. To the right of that, we have a statue of Emperor Song Tseng Gampo in a cave in Yerpa, well dressed, as we can see. Below that, we have a 50, 1,000, oh, to the right of that, we have 1,500 year potter gold bottles found at the tomb of Amido at the birthplace of the 15th Dalai Lama and one of the three traditional temper, temper, Tibetan religions. So seeing how they influence later the Dalai Lama and these significant places that state back to the Tibetan Empire and also the concept of gold and that uh, was already all, it's a highly valued as we might see, but nonetheless beautiful objects. Below that, we have a mural commemorating the victory of Zhang Yi Chao over the Tibetan Empire in 848 CE, their ultimate defeat by the Tong Dynasty, at, in the, found in the Mogao Cave in 156. Um, Mogao Cave number 156, pardon me. To the right of that, we have a copper plated Sakyamuni Buddha statue during the first dissemination of key 
period in Buddhist history. Below that we have, so it was preceded by the Sepa Chang Jung, pardon me for my pronunciation, and um, the Tu Ye Hun and the Tang Dynasty, and it was succeeded by the era of fragmentation. Government was a monarchy. The Senpo chiefs were Song Sang Gampo, was the first from 618 to 650 CE, Tree Song Detson from 753, these are notable ones, to 797, Rapalachen, 815 to 838, and Udom Zen was the last from 841 to 842. I don't think it's necessary to read out all the chief ministers and the chief monks, however, they are listed on the slide. Um, and Oh, maybe I'll do it. Uh, Guard Tongsen Yul Yul Sung, 652 to 667. Guard Trin Ring Sendro, 685 to 699. Nagan Lam Takdra Lukong, 782 to 783. Nanam Shang Gyaltsen Yan Nang, 783 to 796. Nyang Ting Zet Gazin Sang. Po, who was the first from 798 to an unknown end date, and Dranga Palki Tong Ten was the last from unknown time to 838. My apologies for that pronunciation, but I also thought it was important to read them out. These are important people in the past that maybe, although they were so significant at their time, maybe few people still reference their names. So kind of like Ozymandias, like poem by Percy Shelley. And in the top right, we have a map of showing the Tibet Empire. As we can see, it expanded into the Tang Dynasty. They even captured the capital of Chang'an at one point. Um, and going into for like the Kurlak Turks are here and the Uyghur Khaganate, as as we have covered as well, and we will cover in this episode as well. So that is Song Tsen Gampo and the Tibetan Empire. We will now move to the next empire. So. As for the Uyghur Khaganate and the Second Turkic Khaganate. So some background about the Second Turkic Khaganate. Some, it wasn't even considered an empire on the original list that I covered. So I'm like, how could there be a First Turkic Khaganate? Well, also called the Tunic Khaganate anyways, but no Second Turkic Khaganate. But there is considered a Second Turkic Khaganate, period. But the next empire we should really focus in on is the Uyghur Khaganate, which was much larger anyways. But nonetheless, a little bit of background about the Second Turkic Khaganate first is that it was uh, was a cagnate in Central and Eastern Asia founded by the Ashina clan of Goat Turks that lasted between 682 to 744 CE. It was preceded by the Eastern Turkic Cagnate, which we covered as part of the first Turkic Cagnate, and the early Tong dynasty period from 630 to 682 CE. The second Cagnate was centered on Oak Tuken in the upper reaches of the Oak Horn, Oak Ork Han River and was succeeded by its subject Toku's Oku's Confederation, which became the Uyghur Khaganate. So it sort of evolved into the Uyghur Khaganate anyways, maintaining the same capital for a large period of time, eventually changing. But nonetheless, it sort of became the Uyghur Khaganate. And I would even make the argument that the Uyghur Khaganate is the second Turkic Khaganate. But that is debatable. Uh, or that is something I am posing. Uh, it's not something that I've been explicitly read somewhere or been told. So that's my hypothesis. So, the Uyghur Khaganate. The Uyghur Khaganate is a Turkic nomadic state, or was, that emerged in Central Asia during the 8th century CE, playing a significant role in the political landscape of the region. Therefore, we seek to find a history of its rise and fall. Some background information, the Uyghur Khaganate, or also known as the Nine People Clan, was a, was a Turkic empire that existed about a century between the middle of the 8th and 9th centuries. It was a tribal confederation under the Orkhan Uyghur nobility, referred to by the Chinese as the Tsiu Tsing, that's J-I-U-X-I-N-G, or the Nine Clans, a clack of the name of Toghuz Okuz, or Toghuz Toluk, so Nine Clans, but still a Kaganate ruled by centralized authority. So as for their rise, the 8th century establishment. So the Uyghur Khaganate was established in 744 CE by Kutlag Bilge Kagan, who led the Uyghur nomads in the aftermath of the collapse of the Goat Turk Khaganate. My apologies, many of these names um, overlap, but this Kutlag Bilge Kagan is the one we will be biographing soon. So the Uyghurs initially migrated from the Mongolian steppes to the region that is in present-day Mongolia or Xinjiang. That's X-I-N-J-I-A-N-G. As for the relations with the Tong dynasty, so the Tibetan Empire and the Uyghur Empire 
all both interacted with the Tong Dynasty. I didn't see anything explicitly about the Uyghur Khaganate and the Tibetan Empire interacting, however. Maybe because it sees, as we can see on their map, they were separated by the Shatuos. But nonetheless, we shall continue. So, uh, in 744 CE, the Tong court granted the Uyghurs a title protectorate general to pacify the West, acknowledging their role as a buffer against the other nomadic tribes. They sort of made a deal as their on the as their barrier. For example, in ancient England, they had, for example, Chester was given sort of higher rights, or even to create their own laws because they bordered on, I believe, Scotland could be Wales. But that was how it formed. As for military successes, the Uyghurs were successful in military campaigns against the rival Turkic groups and established control over a vast territory, as we shall see, including parts of modern-day Mongolia, China, and parts of Central Asia. In 747, a specific date, Kutla Bilge Kol Kagan died, leaving his youngest son, Bayan Shur Khan, to reign as Kagan al Etmish Bilge, settled and wise, it means. After building a number of trading posts and outposts to the Tang, Bang Bayan Shur Khan used his profits to construct the capital, Ordu Balak, so that's where the capital changes. And another city further up the Selangu River, Bali Balak. The new Kagan then embarked on a series of campaigns to bring all the steppe peoples under his banner. During this time, the empire expanded rapidly and brought the Sekiz Oguz, Kyrgyz, Kurlaks, Turgesh, Tokuz Tartars, Chiks, and the remnants of the Basmils under the Uyghur rule. So centralization. It's a great book, Wolf of the Plains by Khan Eagleton. I read growing up that it's about Genghis Khan, how he united all the tribes. Also in Age of Empires, the video game, there's a Genghis Khan um, scene where he cap and unites all the empires, which is the inspiration of the title of this series. But nonetheless, I like the idea of uniting the tribe, the clans, and nomadic confederations. Pretty cool. Or cognate, even in this form. So as for the zenith of the Kaganate, and starting with Bilge Kagan, there's quite a few Bilge Kagans, but this is Bilge Khan during the period of 756 to 759. So Bilge Kagan, the son of Kutlak Bilge Kagan, one of them, further expanded the Uyghur Kaganate. Under his rule, the Uyghurs solidified the dominance in the region, maintaining a stable alliance with the Tong dynasty. So always have to balance with the Tong dynasty sort of being their ally against other um, uh, nomadic people threats for the Tong dynasty. As for cultural and pol economic prosperity, the Uyghur Khaganate experienced a political of, co of culture and economic a period of cultural and economic prosperity during this time. Trade routes flourished and the Uyghurs actively engaged in diplomatic and cultural exchanges with neighboring states, so also quite a formidable economic force. But as for its fall, the Tang Uyghur alliance dissolved. So the Tang Uyghur alliance began to deteriorate in the mid 8th century. Internal strife with the Tang dynasty and external threats from the nomadic groups stained their relationship, so they sort of fall out with their Tang dynasty relationship. As for Yakub Beg's rebellion, 756 CE, a rebellion led by Yakub Beg, a Uyghur noble, against Bilge Kagan marked the beginning of internal instability. Bilge Kagan was assassinated during the revolt, leading to a power struggle within the Uyghur leadership. So the leader was assassinated. As for tribal conflicts and fragmentation, the Uyghur Kaganate faced internal conflicts and tribal divisions. Various factions vied for power, leading to the fragmentation of a once unified state. As for the invasion of the Kyrgyz in 840s, the Uyghur Khaganate faced external threats from the Kyrgyz Nobats, as we can see on the map, the ones that the Tang dynasty had formerly made an alliance to keep out. In the 840s, and the Kyrgyz launched a series of invasions, contributing to the collapse of the Uyghur political structure. So both sides, the Tang dynasty and the Kyr and Kyrgyz, for example. As for dissolutions from the 840s to 870s, by the mid 9th century, the Uyghur Khaganate had disintegrated into smaller independent tribal entities. The decline of centralized authority marked the end of the Uyghur Khaganate as a political entity. As for his legacy, this, or its legacy, despite the political dissolution, the Uyghur cultural and artistic influences persisted in the region. The Uyghur script, known as the Old Uyghur Alphabet, continued to be used in Central Asia for centuries, so very influential in language as well. The Uyghurs, despite being a nomadic people, which is quite uncommon. The Uyghurs later played a role in various successor states and continued to contribute to this cultural mosaic of the region. Thus, the rise and fall of the Uyghur Khaganate reflected the dynamics, complex, 
nature of the political landscape of Central Asia during this period, shaping the internal power struggles, external invasions, and shifting alliances. So sort of stuck in a rock in a hard place. And also it seems to be common for many of these confederate uh, cognates united many different tribal groups, although they're if the leader is strong enough, they can be held together, motivated. But often, as the leader is less strong, these tribal leaders who are strong themselves see fit. Why don't they rule? Or why don't they uh, create fragmentation? So that seems to be a common theme we're starting to observe with these tribal or these nomadic empires. So to highlight a specific leader, we highlight Kutlag the first Bilge Kagan. So Kutlag the first Bilge or Boila. Kagan, also known by his throne name Kutla Bilge Kul Kagan, pardon me for my pronunciation, I'm certain I'm making errors, and in Chinese sources by the personal name Yao Luoge Yi Biaobi, was a Kagan of the Uyghur Kagnate, the successor state of the second Turkic Kagnate from 744 to 747 AD. So he'd sort of turned the second Turkic Kagnate into the Uyghur Kagnate. So as for his reign, Kutlag the first Bilge Kagan ruled the Uyghur Kagnate during the 8th century around 747 to 759 CE. As for his ascension to the throne, Kutlag the first Bilge Kagan ascended to the throne following the reign of his predecessor Kutla Bilge Kagan. His rule marked a continuation of the Uyghur Kagnate's prominence in Central Asia. As for his military campaigns, during his reign, Kutla the first Bilge Kagan engaged in military campaigns to expand and consolidate the territory of the Uyghur Kagnate. These campaigns included interactions with neighboring regions and polities. As for his religious policies, Kutla the first Bilge Kagan, like the other Uyghur rulers that followed him, him being the first, adopted a policy of religious tolerance. Various religious traditions, including Buddhism, Manichaeism, and Nestorian Christianity, coexisted within the Uyghur Kagnate during his reign. So this, maybe the Buddhism is even coming from its relations with the Tibetan Empire. However, we, I haven't seen references of relationships, but they're close. But nonetheless, maybe they didn't interact. Who knows? I'm hypothesizing here. Uh, if somebody does know, I'd be grateful to discuss this. As for diplomatic, as for cultural contributions, Kutlag the first Bilge Kagan, like some of his predecessors, played a role in supporting the cultural and intellectual advancements within the Uyghur Kagnate, not only being a successful military leader. The adoption of the Uyghur runic alphabet continued during this period, contributing to the development of the unique Uyghur script, as we shall see both these leaders in this episode are significant in language. As for diplomatic relations, the Uyghur Kagnate maintained diplomatic relations with neighboring states, including the Tang Dynasty in China during Kutlag I Bilge Kagan's rule. Diplomacy and trade were important aspects of the Uyghur Kagnate interactions with the broader Central Asian and East Asian regions. As for succession and legacy, following Kutlag I Bilge Kagan's reign, the leadership of the Uyghur Kagnate passed to subsequent rulers. The legacy of Kutlag I Bilge Kagan is remembered as part of a broader historical narrative of the Uyghur Kagnate. Therefore, it's crucial to approach the historical accounts, however, that we've covered that there's very limited information on leaders such as Kutlag I Bilge Kagan, and a lot of it is mixed together because, firstly, for example, he established the or brought the runic script to prominence, so before that there wasn't even a lot of writing, so nonetheless there's a lot of overlap. But nonetheless, <clears throat> part of me think of Kutlag I Bilge Kagan as the first leader of the official Uyghur Kagnate and sort of the transition from the second Turkic Kagnate. So, and a very significant leader for that region, but otherwise there, it's hard to distinguish significantly between many of these leaders just because of lack of data. So, now for the content of the slide. So, title we have Kutlag the first Bilge Kagan and the second Turkic Kagnate and the Uyghur Kagnate. It's the second Turkic Kagnate succeeded by the Tokus Oguz Confederation, or the nine uh, tribes, which became the Uyghur the Kaganate. It's also known as the Uyghur Empire, the Uyghur Kaganate, Tokus Oguz country, or the nine clan people. The significant leader we highlighted was Kutlag the first Bilge Kagan. The empire was Uyghur Kaganate, or the second Turkic Kaganate. The period was 682 to 744, was the second Turkic Kaganate, and 744 to 780 CE, which is the Uyghur Kaganate, which is considered medieval times. I know it was the Tibetan Empire was considered in the medieval period, and 
the Uyghur Kang that is considered medieval period, even though they even it overlap, the two periods do overlap. It just sort of happens to be how they interact with other states that they get divided when they are in this overlap period. So I know it seems like it's uh, um, lack of parallelism. As for modern locations, it's in Mongolia and China. Million square kilometers is 3.1 million square kilometers. Very large, a little bit smaller than the, the Tibetan Empire. Um, quite large compared to some of the smaller city-states, such as significantly larger than Greece and Rome. Maybe some, some larger than some large some of the earlier empires, such as in ancient India, for example. But still, it's um, uh, they were nomadic. So compared to some of our nomadic empires, maybe a little bit smaller, but nonetheless, uh, 2.3. Uh, that's 1.2 million square miles. Percent of the world is 2.3. Percent. That's a still a huge area of land, excluding Antarctica. But they were nomadic, so they're running on horses. So it's easier to hold a larger area of land. Capital city was Otuken, which was the capital under the second Turkic Khagate, and then Ordu Balik after 747 CE, after it was changed during the Uyghur Khagate. The government was a monarchy. The common languages included Old Uyghur and Middle Chinese. Religion was Manichaeism, was the official religion, but they also accepted Kangrism and Buddhism as well. Population was in hundreds of thousands to maybe even in the millions. Images in the top left, we have a Boku Kagan, who is a third Kagan of the Uyghurs, in a suit of armor, converting to Manichaeism in 762. Unfortunately, it's a lot of remnants are missing, but it's still a very beautiful piece of art, I think. You can really see emotion, and it's, you can get an image as to what he might have worn, as to what a royal would have worn. We have, the, to, to the right, the images, the image that sort of looks like a uh, I, I, I was counting to see how many points there were trying to find nine points because I, I thought it refers to the nine clan people or the Uyghur Cagnate, but there's more, so maybe I'm counting it wrong. But nonetheless, that's the representation of the Uyghur Cagnate. And to the right, we have the representation of the second Turkic Cagnate. To the right of that, we have all the Kagans of the second Turkic Cagnate from Elitris Kagan, 682 to 691. Ka, uh, Kapyan Kagan, 600, 691 to 716. Inal Kagan, 7, 600, 6, 716. Bilga Kagan, 716 to 734. And Omiz Kagan, 744. The Tarkans were Tomyuk of note were Tony Cook, 682 to 716. And Kul Tigin, 716 to 731. I'm sorry, we're going out of order. Significant leader we have was Kutlag, the first Bilge Kagan. The empire was the Uyghur Cagnate. Or, oh, no, sorry, we're, we did cover that. My apologies, we're continuing on the images. Now, the full list of leaders of the Uyghur Cagnate Kutlag Bilge Kagan, 744 to 747. Banya Chur Kagan, 747 to 759, who changed the capital. Bogu Kagan, 759 to 780. Tun Bega Tarkhan, 780 to 789. Kulag Bilge Kagan, 789 to 790. Kutlag Bilge Kagan, 790 to 795. Kutlag II Bilge Kagan, 795 to 808. And <clears throat> Bao Yi Kagan, 808 to 821. Chongdi Kagan, 821 to 824. Zhao Li Kagan, 824 to 833. Zhang Qin Kaghan, 833 to 839. Kassar Kagan, 839 to 840. Uge Kagan, 841 to 846. And Anyan Kagan, 846 to 848. Apologies, but we had to go through that, I feel. But nonetheless, you could have fast forwarded. It was preceded by uh, the Western Turkic Cagnate, the Eastern Turkic Cagnate, and Tang Dynasty and Chuen Tao. So that was the Second Turkic Cagnate, and it was succeeded by the Uyghur Cagnate. So the Second Turkic Cagnate became the Uyghur Cagnate, the Yinse Kyrgyz Cagnate, and the Turgit uh, and Tugesh. Now, the second Turkic Cagnate um, preceded the Uyghur Cagnate, but the Uyghur Cagnate was succeeded by the Kara Kanid Cagnate, the Gansu Uyghur Kingdom, the Kingdom of Kocho, and Yinise Kyrgyz Cagnate. Uh, the last two images we have before the map we have the Uyghur princes on the left, in, styled in robes and headgear from the Beslet Cave Number no. 9 from the 9th and 12th centuries CE. And on the right, we have Uyghur princesses from the Beslet murals. So sort of, it's nice to see them together with the princes and princesses might have looked like.
And on the top right, we have a map showing where the Uyghur Kagnite is. It's a massive area of land, 3.21 million square kilometers. Tibetan Empire here, which we just covered. Tong Dynasty, which we've covered previously. And the Kyrgyz, who later threatened them. The Tong Dynasty, one of the uh, made alliances with the Uyghur Kagnite to keep out the other um, uh, barbarians, but they ended up uh, relations soured, and then relations soured over here too. So. And here's the Abbasid Caliphate, a massive empire that we covered previously, the seventh largest so far. Byzantine Empire, also very insignificant too, which we have covered as well. And if you've checked out, I'm very grateful. And if you do in the future, I'm also very grateful. Thank you so much. So comparison between the two very important leaders. So Song Tseng Gampo of the Tibetan Empire and Kutlag the first Bilge Kagan of the Uyghur Kagnate. So their historical context, so Song Tseng Gampo, right, from circa 617 to 650 CE, Song Tseng Gampo ruled in the Tibetan Empire during the 7th century. He was a significant figure in the Tibetan history and is credited with unifying and expanding the Tibetan territories. Kutlag Bilge Kagan reigned around 747 to 759 CE or perhaps actually likely even earlier than that. I believe that's the date of his descendant. So some of these dates differ even. So my apologies for that. But nonetheless, it's likely Kuklag Bilge Kagan likely lived up to 100 years after Song Tseng Gampo. However, they lived in somewhat near regions, I would say, in somewhat similar periods. Hence, we consider the Song Tseng, um, one during the medieval period and the other late antiquity, perhaps. But it was more so how they interact with other empires. But nonetheless, we continue, we digress. Uh, Bill Gay Kagan's reign was associated with military campaigns, maybe more so, religious tolerance, perhaps more so, and cultural developments within the Uyghur Kagnate. So maybe Kutlag the first Bill Gay was more accepting, Manichaeism was the main religion, where Song and Gamble was sort of a Buddhist, pro-Buddhist, and really made it the prominent religion. So maybe one was more uh, focused on one religion and the other was more religiously tolerant. And sort of culturally, I think that extends into almost everything as well. As for their leadership and achievements, Songs and Gampo is known for consolidating Tibetan power, introducing a legal code, and promoting cultural developments. So very key, significant developments there. Also, a language as well. He's credited with the construction of the important religious structures, including the Jokong, Jokang Temple in Lhasa and the Ramosh Temple. Kutlag Bigga Kagan engaged in military campaigns with the Uyghur Kagnate's territory. His reign witnessed continuation of the Uyghur runic alphabet, contributing to cultural and intellectual developments. So both of them, so one maybe contributed more to law, one contributed more to language, but the Tibetan Empire would later contribute to language anyways as well. But nonetheless, I would say they both sort of different in that regards. In terms of religious structures, the Songs and Gampo contributed more to architecture, for example, the Jokang Temple, but it must be noted that as a nomadic empire, could like Bill Gay the first wasn't a, we couldn't shouldn't have expected him to, to to go against the grain and suddenly start building temples when all his predecessors had not either. As for their religious policies, as alluded to, Song Tseng Gampo has played a significant role in the introduction of Buddhism to Tibet. He married Princess Wen Cheng of the Tang Dynasty and Bi Bri Kuti, of the Nepalese princess, both of whom played instrumental roles in the propagation of Buddhism. So um, marrying across countries too, or empires as well. Kutlag the first Bilge Kagan adopted a policy of religious tolerance within the Uyghur Kagnate, allowing the coexistence of various religious traditions, including Buddhism and Nestorian Christianity. Nothing is said that Song Tseng Gampo wasn't religiously tolerant, but it's more that Kutlag the first Bilge Kagan was explicitly religious tolerant, and Song Tseng Gampo was explicitly pro one religion. As for their cultural contributions, Song Tseng Gampo's reign is associated with the spread of Buddhism and the development of early Tibetan script as well, so also an influence on language. He played a role in promoting cultural exchange through marriages with Chinese and Nepalese princesses. It's also noted that perhaps he had them follow his religion and bring his religion to their country, so less likely to be religious tolerant there. But nothing is, no similar story exists for Kutlag, the first Bilge Kagan. As um, for Kulag Bilge Kagan, contributed to the cultural development of the Uyghur Kagnate, supporting the adoption of the Uyghur runic alphabet. So it also has that language element, despite less being written on him because he was the one to bring the language, but more is written about Song Tseng Sang Gampo. So maybe Kutlag the first Bilge Kagan's relative impact to language was larger than Song Tseng Gampo's individual impact on language, or maybe it was less, but nonetheless, the relative impact also matters 
more or not more but in a way as well as the absolute impact relative influences that being compared to other leaders in their or their culture of their empire so as for diplomacy song sang gampo engaged in diplomatic relations with neighboring regions including the tong dynasty in china so they had a pact and then a treaty but it broke as well so well, his successors were not as successful the Uyghur Khaganate under Kutlag Bilge Kagan maintained diplomatic relations with neighboring states, including the Tang Dynasty. So both of them seemed to interact with the Tang Dynasty, but it didn't seem like they interacted with each other. As for their legacy, Song Tseng Gampo is remembered as a foundational figure in Tibetan history, contributing to the political and cultural identity of the Tibetan Empire and Tibet today, and even Buddhism today, perhaps, and the, the languages that preceded or followed her. As Kutlag the first Bilge Kagan, and the structures that are still there. As for Kutlag built the first Bilge Kagan, his legacy includes his contributions to the military, cultural, and religious aspects of the Uyghur Khaganate during his rule. Something that's similar about both is that they both founded their respective empires, the Uyghur and the Tibetan, respectively, or inverse, respectively. While both songs are inverse, respectively, because they should have been in the other order. While both Song, thus, while both Song Sen, Gampo, and Kutlag the first Bilgai Kagan were influential rulers in their respective empires, their reigns occurred in distinct regions and historical contexts, shaping the trajectories of the Tibetan and Empire and the Uyghur Khaganate differently. So, very slight difference, just a difference of a hundred years, and just a difference of you know, one empire or two empires over, but significantly different lives. But maybe could they have done a better job if they switched places? Perhaps they both would have. Perhaps neither would have. Maybe one of would have. So that is the Tibetan Empire and the Uyghur Empire, and as well the Second Turkic Empire, and as well Song Tseng Gampo and Kutlag the First Bilge Kagan. This is Agents of Empires. My name is Kaylin Ashcroft. This is Cashcroft TV. Thank you very, very much for your support, and I'd be very grateful if you continue to provide it in any way, shape, or form. Thank you so much.